you have your Bible this morning, if you'll turn with me to 2 Samuel and the 15th chapter, that's where we'll begin our study in just a moment. So thankful to see some visiting, Garland and Connie Breeden are here, they're near and dear to my heart, appreciate them, others who are visiting with us, so thankful that you've come today. Look out, I just want this congregation to know how much I love you. You know, it's genuine affection I see between each of you that has just really helped me in the last year to be encouraged and grow, and you know, a congregation that shows love and affection for one another shows encouragement and edification. And I just appreciate so much all that you do for one another and for the cause of Christ. In your Bible in 2 Samuel, in the 15th chapter, I want to read with you, beginning at verse 10. Then Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigns in Hebron. And with Absalom went 200 men, invited from Jerusalem, and they went along innocently and did not know anything. Then Absalom sent for Ahithophel the Gideonite, David's counselor, from his city, from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices, and the conspiracy grew strong, for the people with Absalom continually increased in number. When you read 2 Samuel and the 15th chapter, you'll find that David is reigning as king of Israel at that time. But when David looked out, he saw there was turmoil and problems with the kingdom and in the land. In 2 Samuel 15, you'll find there's one who is leading a rebellion. And one thinks about that in a government situation, and one could think about all the potential pitfalls that could occur to a nation if there is a rebellion or a civil war caused by some who rebel against the king. But when you read in the Bible in 2 Samuel 15, a rebellion may not surprise you, but what might shock us is when we see the one leading the rebellion. David doesn't look out at the Philistine Goliath this time, and he doesn't look out at a Moabite, but when David looks out at the one who's seeking his life and seeking his kingdom, it's his own son Absalom. And when you read in 2 Samuel 15, you'll find that David is going to have to flee the city of Jerusalem. And some of his own counselors, like Ahithophel, had betrayed David and decided to go against David and side with Absalom. So when you read in 2 Samuel 15, you'll find that David is leaving the city of Jerusalem, going over the Kidron Valley. And in verse 30, you see that he's going up the Mount of Olives. And as he's ascending and going up, he has his head covered and he's barefoot. And the people who are with him covered their heads and went up, weeping as they went. I've often thought of the tears that were shed because of the rebellion of Absalom. But then I started to look at that man identified as David. And I thought about what that must have done to David to look out and to see his own son lead a rebellion. You know, I think most of us, if we're honest, there comes a time in life where we get to a certain age, we kind of don't always see eye to eye with our parents, and there are many times that we kind of have falling out. But I want to tell you the one thing I think is far too common in our day, and it's always been the case. It's not that just that there are many times disagreement. It's that a child can break their father's heart. And what I want to do for just a few moments of our time is to talk about how to break a father's heart. Then we'll make application and the lesson yours. The first thing I want to show you is that when you look at Absalom, his open rebellion against his father is what broke the heart. Have you ever thought about somebody who just looks at their father and says, I hate the very ground you walk on? Now I want to tell you that's one thing. But here you find a young man who does not only hate, he is seeking to take his father's life and take his kingdom. When I look at David leaving and going from the city of Jerusalem, climbing the Mount of Olives, I've often thought about the tears he must have shed because when he looked back, he saw not just the people rebellion, but it was his own son, his own son leading the rebellion. And here his father's heart is broken. And young men and young ladies, I want you to keep that in mind, that here was a man who broke a father's heart by living contrary to how he was raised and rebelling not only against his father's rules and regulations, but rebelling against his reign as king. And he sought to take and get rid of his father so he could take his place. But then if you take your Bible, notice if you will, in the book of Genesis and the 37th chapter. We have another picture of a man who was brokenhearted, a father whose heart was broken. 
In Genesis 37, you'll remember that Joseph was sent by Jacob to go and tell his brothers and to check on them while they're out tending to the flock. And when Jacob goes out, or Joseph goes out, you remember they see Joseph. And because of the envy they have for that young man, you remember that they said, let's kill him. And then Reuben talks him out of doing that, and they had thrown him in a pit. And when some people were traveling by, they were able to sell them into slavery. Have you ever thought about the hatred of the brothers to sell their own brother into slavery? But notice when they said, we got to go back and face daddy, what are they going to do? They can't tell him that they sold him into slavery. They can't tell him their thought was to kill him. So what they do is they take his tunic in verse 31 of Genesis 37 and they dip it in the goat's blood. And they take it to their father and they say, is this your son's tunic? They knew it was. But what they're trying to do is de deflect their responsibility and project it somewhere else. They don't want Jacob to know about their wickedness. They don't want their father to know about their envious. They don't want their father to know what they've done. And notice that in verse 33, Jacob jumps to a conclusion. He said, that is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has been torn to pieces. And won't you see why he made that conclusion? All he had left was a tunic. He knew he made the tunic. He knew it was special to Joseph. And now Joseph is not there. And notice verse 34. He tears his clothes. He puts sackcloth on his waist. He mourns for his son many days. I've often wondered just how long did Jacob stay in that state of mourning. But look in verse 35. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. In other words, he's saying, don't come right now. And notice what he says. He says, I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Can you picture the broken heart of Jacob? Can you imagine what it was like for that man every night to pillow his head thinking his son was dead, thinking that an animal had torn him to pieces? And no doubt that was something that just constantly weighed on his mind. So when I look in Genesis 37, not only do I see a broken heart, I see a man deeply grieved. And I thought about who broke the heart. You might think it's the brothers, and that's exactly right, because of their deception. He thought his son was dead. But then if you take your Bible, if you will kindly, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 2. And when you come to 1 Samuel chapter 2, notice that there is a man identified as Eli. And you remember he's high priest on that occasion in the land. But you remember that he had two sons, and the Bible says they were wicked. You remember that in verse 12, the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord, yet they're priests. Of all the people who should have known about the holiness of God and the righteousness of God and the love of God, it would have been the priests. They're the ones who ministered in the temple. They're the ones who knew what God had said. They knew the law in and out. But notice there's a difference in knowing the law and knowing the Lord. And notice the priests, their custom was with the people in verse 13. If any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged flesh hook in his hand while the meat was boiling, and he would thrust it in. And they would take that which did not belong to them. And even when there was objection, notice they would not listen. In verse 16, if someone says, I don't think we need to give that to you, he would say, you give it to me now, or I'll take it by force. And so the sin of the young man was great before the Lord. Every time I read that, I think about Eli. Because when it drops down to 1 Samuel, notice in verse chapter 2, down verse 28. Notice the statement. Eli, he said, did I not reveal myself in the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribe of Israel to be my priest, to offer up on my sacrifice, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I've commanded in my dwelling place, and honor your sons more than me to make yourself fat with the best of all the offering of Israel to my people? Now, those God said, Eli, there's a problem here. You look at your sons, and because they're your sons, you're condoning an action. And you'll remember that because of that, Eli is going to eventually, his life's going to be taken. But what I want you to observe is the fact that God said, my heart's broken. God said, Eli, you are honoring your sons more than you do me. You're showing more dedication, loyalty, and love to them than hear me. 
And he said, you are allowing them to do that which defiles the sacrifice. So when I take my Bible, I looked at those three things and I thought about how to break a father's heart. I want you to think about several things. First of all, I want you to look at fathers today. You know, I'm thankful for the privilege of being a father. But one thing I've noticed as the older I get, I don't know much about parenting. I had a sermon years ago, How to Raise Children. Now it's just feeble suggestions from a fellow pilgrim. I don't know that much. I, I thought I'd do it. I always preach when you're an expert because once you start to learn you don't know anything, it just throws away sermons. And I'll tell you, as, as a father, I look back and I have some regrets. You know, as a preacher, you spend a lot of time in your day studying and, and preparing things for class. And, and when I'd come home, I had studied, but I wouldn't always take time to study with my boys. And I feel remorse for that. And I've apologized to them. Because I think about the importance of training our children and teaching them children. And let me tell you, young parents, while your children are young and their hearts are tender, don't forget that opportunity. Don't make the mistake I made. Spend time with them teaching them the importance of God's Word and teaching them the importance of following God's Word. What are we training them? What are we teaching them? How are we raising them? You know, you have 18 years. Then after that, you may still be an influence them over their whole life. But you know, you just have a time where you can instill in them the things they need to know. But that brings up something else. As a father, one of the hardest things I'm learning, and I'm just learning it, some of you have went through it, is there's a time to let go. You know, when God made man in Genesis 2, and he talked about in verse 24 that a man is to leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they're to be with one another. One of the hardest things for parents sometimes to do is learn to let go. When a child comes of age and wants to be more independent and have more responsibility or marry and move out, you know, that's sometimes hard. And one thing I've learned, the harder you hold on to some things, the more it hurts when you let go. Sometimes it just hurts when you have to let go. And when you think about children, there's going to come a time they're no longer under your control. There's going to come a time you just have to let them go. I'll tell you what I've learned. I've seen a lot of marriages hurt because a mother or father didn't learn to let go. They continued to tell the child what they needed or wanted them to do, and the spouse didn't have any say. One of the hard things to do as a father that can be heartbreaking is to let them go. But then there was something else. As I was looking at a father, I started to think, how many have broken hearts because of the action of others, not their own. In Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20, it says that the father should not bear the iniquity of the son, nor the son bear the iniquity of the father. And many times you look at parents and you look at fathers, they work, they try, they're doing the best they can to raise up their children. But when the children grow, they're not faithful. And many times I've seen and heard preaching to just make them feel more guilty for something the child did, not the parent. When the child comes of age, he's a free moral agent. You could have done the best you could in training them and teaching them, but when they become of age and you let them go, they may not continue to walk with the Lord. And I thought about how many parents and fathers have a broken heart, even though it's not their fault. You know, I learned a long time ago not to say what my children will do and will not do. Down in Dixon County, there was a fellow one time they went to, and, to his parents because he had been missing services. And the parents said about this young man, he's doing the best he can. And one of the members there said, I don't think he is. And that fellow went home, and then later that week, his son was arrested for streaking in Van Leer. I want to tell you something. Don't say what your children will and will not do because you just don't know. I'll tell you, sometimes if we're not careful, we can start to have an attitude towards those who need encouragement, but we have self-righteousness. But then I thought of something else. What to do with a parent's broken heart? And the first thing I start to think about, children, are you breaking your father's heart? Have you rebelled against him? Have you rebelled against God? Have you left all the teachings that he brought you up to teach you about heaven and hell and right and wrong? Have you rebelled against your father? And if you have, why? You may say, my father wasn't a good man. I'm sorry about that. 
Not everybody has a good father, but I want to tell you something. If you had a father who tried to teach you right from wrong, you need to be thankful for that. Sometimes what we do is we look and we look at the shortcomings of our parents, but we never give them credit for the good things they've done. And sometimes I'm fearful we break a father's heart by being ungrateful. I didn't realize how ungrateful I was until I became a father. I remember when I first learned to drive, <clears throat> Daddy was going to get a new truck, and he got a stick shift because I was having trouble learning how. Boy, I learned how once he got that new truck. No problem. And Daddy had a sign, and I still have it in the basement. It says, no need. And he stuck it on the front, and any time I'd ask, can I borrow the truck, he'd point at it. What's that sign say? No need. Never got to borrow that truck until later on. I took the truck, and I started to think about how ungrateful I was with the things he had provided for me. I always wanted the best, or I wanted more. And many times I look back at my daddy, and I think, all the things he'd done to try to help me. But then I thought of something else. I thought about fathers, the way you really break a heart is when we look at our children and we condone their wrongs. Because they're our children. I want to tell you, that's so easy to want to do. When I look out and I think about children, and I think about them being wrong, and I think about them living in sin, it's hard to just admit they're wrong. And sometimes it's hard to teach them and, and, and tell them directly their sinful action. But we can't defend action that's contrary to God's word. We can't justify their wrongs just because they're our children. There comes a time we have to tell them they're lost. That was the problem with Eli. He honored his children more than he did God. I'll tell you something. That becomes difficult. It becomes so difficult when it's your child that's not living right. It becomes so difficult when you look out with love for your child and you know what they're doing is wrong. But I want to tell you one of the problems today is we defend the wrong instead of correcting the wrong. We've left that part out. And I'll tell you, when we defend a wrong or we justify a wrong just because they're our children, what we're doing is we're letting them go off into the far country of sin further from God, further from the truth. Now, I think you, can, you maintain a relationship with them. You love them. You teach them. You talk to them. You don't nag them. But I do want you to understand, we don't let them think they're okay in that situation. One of the most dangerous things to do is to accept sin. And so often I have done that because I didn't want to offend someone. And yet, my friend, what's the worst thing we can do? Allow someone to stay in a situation that's going to cost them their soul. You may not like the confrontation. I hate confrontation. But it comes. And there has to be a time that somebody plays the adult and tells the child that is wrong, even if they're out on their own. And God said, you know, Eli, you kind of honor your children more than you do me. You're breaking my heart. I've often thought about breaking the father's heart. You look at Abraham and Gideon. They chose God over their parents. They chose to live right instead of rebel. But I've often thought about how many times has Mike Richardson broke the heart of God? How many times have I rebelled against him, acted wicked in his sight? I'll tell you what I've come to learn. When I've disciplined my boys and they said they were sorry, that just makes you so your, your, your heart's broken almost because you see that they realize their sin it makes you feel good but at the same time you're just choked up and about to cry and I think about when God sees one of us say I'm so ashamed of what I've done and I want to be right how that must make him feel towards a child it's interesting Absalom's the one that David talked about and he said to Joab, you're going to go to war. Joab, you deal gently with the young man for my sake. I've said this here before, but I'm not ashamed to say it again. Joab didn't listen to what David said. And it caused David great pain. If you ever see one of the Richardson boys out here in the world, you see them walking contrary to God's will, you see them off the path, please rebuke them. 
and help them get back on the path. But do it gently. For as David said, they're my sons. And I want them to go to heaven. If you need to make your life right this morning, we pray you come as together we stand and sing.